Amen. The title of the message is We Don't Want to Be Ashamed. We don't want to be ashamed. If you notice there in the second to last verse, verse 28, uh, there's where I get that, uh, that idea. It says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so uh, I want to talk about that this afternoon. This morning in Sunday school in Iola, some, one of the things that we do is uh, uh, I've been going through this kind of series of doing word studies. And what I'll do is take all the places in the Bible where it uses a particular word, or a lot of times it's several words that basically mean the same thing. And this time it was shame and ashamed. And I think it was like, I don't know, 13 pages or something like that of verses uh, just from the Bible. And I plugged those all in together and... Uh, and yes, it was, it, was, it was good. It's really helpful for this message, just this concept of what it means to be ashamed or to have shame. You think about it uh, right off the bat in the, in the Bible in Genesis, you know, what happens? The first time sin enters into uh, man, you know, and it, 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 there's this awareness because they ate of the, the tree of, good, uh, of uh, knowledge of good and evil. And there was this awareness all of a sudden of sin. And they said, we're naked. And there was a shame. They hid themselves and tried to cover themselves with uh, uh, fig leaves and stuff like that. There was this idea of shame, and that comes with, it's, it's something we might call a conscience, right? It comes with this idea of knowing that we weren't supposed to do something, and then we did it, and we find, or maybe we didn't know we, were, we weren't supposed to do it, but then all of a sudden it's, you know, we're found out that we're doing something wrong, we've been exposed, and we have shame, right? That can uh, definitely happen. The Bible uh, talks a lot about uh, we went through some different passages where uh, shame was attached to, you know, somebody being uncovered or naked, and then that shame there. But if you think about that, even like, uh, you know, kind of metaphorically, like you just feel like you're exposed, like every, every eye's on you, and this feeling of shame, like I can't believe that happened, I'm so ashamed, uh, you know. And uh, you, usually it's not that bad. I mean, it, it, it might just be kind of in our, in our mind, but there's this feeling, this grief, this embarrassment. Uh, because we're ashamed of what has been exposed. All right, the Bible says that those who hate the Lord uh, and don't follow His commandments are brought to shame. Look at Job chapter 8. Job chapter 8, verse 22. Job eight twenty-two says, They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame. <laughs> that's, that's worse than being naked. <laughs> clothed with shame. Maybe it's the same thing. And the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. And so those that hate God will be brought to shame. Those who lift themselves in pride will be brought to shame. The Bible says, Proverbs eleven two: When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But when the, with the lowly is wisdom. Think about that verse where Jesus says, um, in a couple of different passages, I'm thinking about Mark. Uh, I can't remember the right, the same, the exact wording, but he says that the Pharisees loved to be. Uh, they would assume that they would get these high, lofty seats. You know, they would take these seats and think, "Oh, look at me! You know, I've got the, I've got the good seat." And he said, "You know, don't assume that you have this high position, lest somebody else comes by and he's got more honor than you, and then you're told, hey, what are you doing up in that position?'" You know, sometimes pastors on a platform will sit up on the platform and they're sitting in the chair, you know, and that's kind of like the high place. Can you imagine if a pastor came in and just marched right, uh, I mean, a, a guest preacher came in, marched right up there, sat in that seat, and the pastor came up there and said, what are you doing? <laughs> that's not your seat. Go sit down there. That'd be embarrassing, right? <laughs> if you brought to shame, right? So he said, rather take the low seat, and then maybe somebody will come and say, hey, take the higher seat, brother. And, uh, and so uh, this idea of being shame, you know, and sometimes we get lifted up with pride and God has a way of just knocking us down, especially if you're Christians. You know, don't ever be bothered by the fact that the world does wrong and sometimes it doesn't seem like they're caught. You know, when's that guy going to be brought down? Hey, look, everybody is going to be brought down at some point. But God deals with his children in a specific way. And you know that when, if you're his child and you get lifted up with pride, he's going to tear you down. He's going to make sure uh, that you are humbled, okay, because he loves you and he wants you to be uh, uh, he, a better person. All right, so in this chapter, we're just going through First, Second John, and uh, we're just only on chapter 2 right now. And I want to show you that the main 
context here, the main uh, application to get out of this past, out of this whole chapter, is that we don't want to be ashamed. Okay, so first of all, let me think about this. What do I mean by we? We don't want to be ashamed. Well, it's very important to understand when you're reading through First, Second John that he's talking to believers. All right, he's talking to believers. If you don't understand that, you're going to be confused by a lot of what is said in this book. But let me just prove it to you real quickly. In chapter 1, we talked about this a little bit last week, but in chapter 1, look at verse 3. That, uh, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, and you also, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship, you know, if your fellowship with us, and that includes you, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So he's talking to Christians, he's just, and he's not trying to convert people to become Christians. He's just saying, hey, we want our fellowship. Uh, we want to have fellowship with one another, and our fellowship is with God. And we want to have our joy full and encourage each other. Uh, and all this, look at verse 7. He says, but if ye walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us, us from all sin. This is the condition, see, that we, we, we want to live in, this, this idea of being washed and being clean in God's sight. Now, look, if you've if you're been saved, you're covered by the blood of Christ. I mean, you're, you are clean in every sense of the word. You've got on the white wedding garment, okay? And, and, and so, but there's another, that's spiritually speaking, but there's another aspect on this life to where the things that you do is going to be held accountable for. All things will become, you know, will be uh, uh, judged. Okay, and so uh, the, this is talking about living in that place where our joy is full and we have fellowship one with another. And uh, we'll see in this chapter right here uh, how, how we're going to do that. Look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 2. More proof that he's talking, when I say we, he's talking to believers, okay? Uh, number one, verse one says, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. All right. He's talking about children. He's talking about those who have been converted. They've been born again. Paul used the same kind of analogy. He talked to those who he had converted as his children. All right. They've been born. He led them to the Lord. They were like his spiritual babies in a sense. And so he talks about that. And that's what John's saying. Look at verse uh, number two. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see two categories there? He's saying our sins, but not only our sins, he died for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Now, the whole world's not been saved yet, obviously. So there's two classifications. He's our sins, we've been saved, and then there's the sins of the whole world. All right, They have not been saved yet, but he still died for their sins. They just need to know about that. They need to accept that. And then they need to get into the light, fellowship with the light. Okay, So verse number 7, more proof. He uses the word brethren. That's another key word. If you're a Christian and you see, come across the word brethren, it's usually he's talking about believers. Now, there's sometimes the Bible uses that talking about blood relatives. Uh, but in this case, he's talking about believers. The context makes that clear. Verse 13. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. Verse 13 says, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I mean, you can tell he's writing to all ages and people, you know, that have been saved maybe for different levels of time, but they're all believers. He's making that very clear in this passage. And so that's going to change the way that you interpret the, this, these letters whenever you realize this truth. Verse uh, 21. I have not written... Uh, well, actually, let's back up because I noticed this whenever uh, Brother Justin was reading this. It really stuck out. All right, this whole... The end of this, he's talking about their Antichrist. It's the end time. There's these people that that have fallen and believe in a lie. They never really, he goes in to say they, they, they went out from among us because they weren't of us, right? And so he's saying these people, they didn't really believe the gospel, all right? Have we seen that happen? People that said that they were of us, but they really didn't believe in the gospel. And so it wasn't long before they're out preaching heresy, but we're like, hey, we know 
that 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 the rest of us right are are in this together. So what does it say there in verse uh, twenty? Let's see. Let's start in nineteen. They went out from uh, uh, from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. Now some people say, see, because they started sinning. And if you're living in sin, you weren't actually a Christian. And so, look, they went out from... That's not what he's talking about. He goes in and makes it very clear now that what he's talking about are people that were believing this lie and saying that Jesus Christ wasn't uh, the Son of God. He says in verse 20, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Now, obviously, we're, we're all still learning, but we've got the Holy Spirit within us, so we've got the capability of understanding all things that are spiritual. The world doesn't have that capability. The world is spiritually blind. The carnal mind can't receive the things of God. All right, verse 21 says, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth. He just got done saying you know all things, right? I'm not writing unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that you know, uh, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist. See, this whole, that last section is talking about those people who went out from them because they never were saved. They never were among them. So, so that's what I mean when I'm talking about we. Remember that the context of this passage is talking about believers. Okay, now we believers, we don't want to be ashamed. And the meaning of the word ashamed and the word shame, let me just give them to you straight from the dictionary. And I proved in Sunday school this morning that uh, the Bible is very consistent with these definitions. Here is uh, just straight from like dictionary.com or something like that. A painful feeling, this is shame, a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. So somebody knows that what they did was foolish. They know that what they did was wrong. So it causes them this painful feeling of humiliation, right? And everybody should have a little bit of that in them. Everybody has a conscience unless... Their conscience was seared with the hot iron. Unless they've been given over to a reprobate mind and they are psychopaths, all right? Or sociopaths. We had a little bit of debate on the car up here if it's sociopath or psychopath. <laughs> Very closely related. But anyway, uh, so, so this, for the, mo for the most part, everybody experiences some shame, all right? Or they are ashamed from time to time. Ashamed means embarrassed or guilty because of one's actions, characteristics, or associations, all right? Uh, characteristics. Interestingly, uh, yeah, this isn't in my notes, but we talked this morning a little bit about how the Bible talks about it's a shame, certain characteristics. Like, so if a man, if a man is in church and he has long hair and he's praying, he's getting up, pastoring, uh, uh, preaching, or prophesying, or whatever, the Bible says it's a shame for that man to have long hair. And so, uh, and likewise, it says it's a glory for a woman to have long hair but it's a shame for her to have short hair. And so there's certain things, just behavior. Now, look, some people don't know that, right? Some people out there have never been taught that. Uh, a lady might shave her head or whatever, and maybe there's something within her that knows that that's rebellious or knows that that's, a, that's not a, I mean, you know, most ladies, uh, they get cancer or something like that, and they're going to lose all their hair. What do they want? They want a wig or something to cover that because they don't like the idea. I mean, that's my glory. Most women know that, but some maybe were raised where they don't understand that. But the moment that you're aware of that, there's this consciousness and there's this like, whoa, I'm ashamed. <laughs> right? I didn't know that. How embarrassing. Maybe you weren't embarrassed before. Maybe you are now. Nakedness. The Bible talks about nakedness. Uh, it talks about whenever the buttocks was exposed, these people were shamed. That was like a punishment. You know, they would take their enemies and they would rip the back of their garment off so that their backside's showing. And that was a huge embarrassment. I mean, wouldn't you be embarrassed to be exposing your backside? But see, there's a lot of people in this culture right now <laughs> that don't realize that. We went to a funeral the other day, and it was like if somebody went over to pick some trash up on the ground, it was like, whoa, man, <laughs> you know, your, your buttocks is exposed. I don't want you to be embarrassed, but <laughs> because that should be something that brings shame. Not just the buttocks. The Bible talks about the thighs, right? Why is it so important for the priest to have on these linen breeches, right, that went down and covered their thighs and up to their groin? What did it call? Not growing. It calls it a loins. Thank you. And, it, and any of that section there is nakedness. Well, so a lot of people aren't ashamed about that because they've got so desensitized to it and so used to uh, just being naked all the time. But look, there comes a point where you have to realize, 
I'm exposing too much. That's embarrassing. If you wear, the, if you wear those 1980s uh, running shorts, you should be embarrassed. It's a shame. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, this is uh, what I mean by being ashamed, but it's more than that. It's more than that. I don't want to be like found out that I was doing something that I wasn't supposed to be doing. I was in a place I wasn't supposed to be. Anybody ever, uh, particularly whenever you're younger, you, you, didn't, you didn't catch which <laughs> restroom you were supposed to go in, and you accidentally went into the wrong one, and you just instantly turned red when you realized you were in the wrong place. Again, our society today doesn't, <laughs> doesn't get that, but, uh, uh, but there was a time. Anyway, so we don't want to be ashamed like that. But also, the Bible says that we can be ashamed by the actions of others. Okay, so look at Proverbs 29, 15. I guess I could quote it. Everybody's familiar with it, I'm sure, but let's go ahead and go there. Proverbs 29, 15. It says, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now, it doesn't matter if the child actually feels shame or not for what they're doing. Because of their behavior, it could bring the mother to shame, right? Or the father, for that matter. But when they're left to themselves, no discipline, no punishment, whatever, they'll bring their, their mother to shame, the Bible says. Look at, since we're there, Proverbs chapter 12, turn back a little bit. Proverbs 12. In verse 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Okay, so a husband could be ashamed by the actions of his wife, and obviously vice versa too. Proverbs 3.35 says, The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. So the person that just lives foolishly, or another thing the Bible says that brings a person to shame would be laziness. If somebody's lazy, that's going to bring them to shame, uh, which is foolishness, really. But a fool, right, the end, reaction, the end uh, result of his foolishness, his promotion, if you will, is shame. Whereas the wise uh, inherit glory. Okay, so, uh, so obviously we don't, want to be, we don't want to be ashamed to others that we love, to our family, to our church, or anything like that. Uh, we don't want to be ashamed to our to our country. Even uh, you remember the. Uh, it seems like every year in the Olympics, if they have Olympics in another country, it seems like there's always some stupid people from the United States that end up doing some dumb things. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, there was somebody. I don't know. I guess maybe a teenager. I don't remember. You remember the caning? Somebody was in a, a different country. And they did something stupid, broke some of their laws, and they said the punishment is they're going to have to get beat with a cane. And everybody in the U.S. was in an uproar. How could they allow him to have to go through those punishments? Those aren't punishments on our country. Yeah, but you were in their country, <laughs> and you knew what, the, what the, the punishment was, and you still did it. Anyway, the shame on our country. We don't want to be ashamed to other people, so we've got to be careful how we live. But, not, but most importantly, we don't want to be ashamed to the Lord. All right? We don't want to be ashamed to the Lord. Now, in a certain manner of speaking, we don't ever have to worry about the shame some people have to worry about whenever they stand before the Lord thinking that they're getting in by their good works. Right? Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? Done many wonderful works. And he's like, I never knew you. How can you imagine the shame that would come? Look at Daniel, if you would. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. What a great verse. Obviously, many years before Christ even came, but uh, the prophecy is so great. It says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, talking about the resurrection, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Some people are going to be ashamed for all eternity. Now, I do believe that Christians can be ashamed in the resurrection, but it's not going to be for all eternity. I think we're just going to be confronted with how little we did for Christ, some people. Uh, all of us are going to wish we would have done more. Some people, all the things that maybe they thought were good works uh, or good uh, accomplishments, all that's going to be burned up, 
and they're going to be shamed because they got nothing left. They're naked, if you will. Okay, they got not have anything left because they didn't lay up those treasures in heaven. There's going to be a sense of being ashamed, but we're never going to be ashamed. We're not going to be ashamed for all eternity. All right, we uh, Christ already took care of that, and uh, and we don't have to worry about that. But some will be sh ashamed forever, all eternity, ashamed, and they're going to be living with the consequence of their foolishness and rejecting the Lord. We definitely don't want that. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans 10 verse 11. Now there's a little bit of a vari variance here on opinions as to what this means. I think it's probably talking about uh, when we stand before the Lord. We won't be ashamed. Some people say uh, that it's talking about when we're, you know, if, if you're a Christian, you won't be ashamed, like, to give people the gospel or whatever. But here's what it says. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And I know why they're saying that, because, because it just said in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart. So they, they think what it's saying, confess, right? You won't be ashamed. You'll just go out confessing Christ. But the, one of the problems with that would be is that's kind of saying that if somebody doesn't have that, then maybe they're not saved. And I don't believe that that's true, right? Because I think there's a lot of people who got saved. In fact, the majority of people get saved never tell anybody about Christ, right? That's just, that's just the way it is. I don't think that means that they're not saved. I think what that verse is actually saying is that if they believed, they're not going to be ashamed, okay? They've called upon the Lord, and they're not going to be uh, ashamed. But either way, we certainly do not want to be ashamed in the presence of the Lord. Mark chapter 8. This is all introduction. I'll get to 1 John here in a little bit. Just teasing. <laughs> Mark chapter 8. Look at verse 38. <clears throat> this would almost back up the other definition of Romans 10 11. But either way. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So it's talking about the return of Christ, okay? In the, so I believe that's linked with the resurrection. When the first time we arise, the first resurrection, rise before God. Um, I, I think probably everybody in here knows this. There's two uh, resurrections. Re uh, Revelation 20 talks about this first first resurrection. Uh, I'm talk not talking about like Jesus' resurrection and Lazarus' resurrection. Okay, some people say, no, there's lots of resurrections. I'm talking about Romans 20 type resurrection. There's one resurrection, which is at the rapture. When we're resurrected, we stand before God and we believers have a judgment. All right, we are judged in the presence of the Lord. We're not going to lose our salvation. We're judged according to our works. I believe that has to do with what is going to happen in the millennium. We'll be rewarded accordingly and given certain job assignments, perhaps, according to what we did in this life. Okay? Then there's a great white throne judgment that happens after the millennium. Okay? And that's where people will stand and be judged uh, according to uh, the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? And so uh, we don't have to worry about that judgment because we've already been, uh, been saved. So he's saying here, though, that in that first resurrection, right, if you were ashamed of him in this evil and adulterous generation, uh, you know, then there is going to be a sense in which he's ashamed of you. Not going to throw you in, in, in hell, right, but there's a sense in which he's just saying, why didn't you, why were you ashamed of me? You know, why didn't you, think about Peter, how embarrassed he was when he realized I denied Christ. And there he is looking at me in the face. Yeah. And he's like, I denied him three times. And I even told him I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and he said, yes, you are. How embarrassed, how shameful, right? Well, some people are going to face that in the resurrection, and they're going to be ashamed of themselves. We definitely don't want to be ashamed at his, uh, his coming. Okay, so real quickly, go back to 1 John. And so I believe that there's a lot there. There's a whole lot there in 1 John 2, but I think that if you, if you think this through and you read the whole thing, uh, consider what he says there in verse 28, you'll see that this whole chapter is talking about the fact that we don't want to be ashamed. 
Nothing's about salvation. You're already saved. He's talking to believers. But he's saying we don't want to be ashamed. So how do we avoid being ashamed? Number one, we first of all need to know what is sin, right? Now look, at the end, when you find out you've been living in sin or you've been doing something wrong, whether it's the, you know how they, you probably all heard the sin of omission or the sin of commission, you know, some stuff you were supposed to do, you didn't do. Some stuff you, you, uh, you, you weren't supposed to do and you did those things. And, uh, and, and all those things will be held accountable for. And so, but, but if you didn't know that, right, you didn't, there was no way to prepare for that. But if we know what's right and what's wrong, we can start living our life accordingly, right? And so it's very important that we read the Word of God. And so what does John say? John says in verse 1 and 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. If you're not going to sin, you've got to know what sin is, right? <laughs> you got to know what sin is so you know not to do those things. I like how uh, David said, I hide thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee, okay? And it says, if any man sin, oh, by the way, Christians, you're going to sin, he hath an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, so we understand that we can go uh, to Christ and we can be forgiven of our sins. You say, well, I'm already forgiven. Yeah, spiritually you're forgiven. But in this life we're still held accountable for the different things, and so we need to go to the Lord whenever we commit a sin, and we need to uh, well, look, at, look at the end of chapter 1. Verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And his word is not in us. Again, I've heard that verse used a lot of times when, uh, for soul winning. You know, trying to uh, preach that verse to the lost people saying, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Well, that is true, right? But that's to believers. A lost person could confess their sin, go to the priest and say Hail Marys and all that all day long. That ain't going to get them saved. That's they need right. to accept Jesus Christ, okay? Amen. But Christians, we need to constantly go before the Lord. Say, Lord, I messed up. <laughs> forgive me of my sins, right? You confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. So the first thing we need to do to prevent being ashamed in the presence of the Lord, we need to know what sin is, okay? We need to read the Bible, we need to go to church, all those things that so we can learn what is right and what is wrong. Number two, not only do we need to know those things, we need to keep them. Look at verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Again, it's not saying that you're not saved, right? But what it's saying is if you're saying, if you're claiming to be acting like a Christian, and you're doing these things, you're not acting like a Christian. You're not being a Christian. It's kind of like where he's going to say later, if you say you love the Lord, but you don't keep his commandments, you don't love the Lord. Well, somebody will say, well, see, if you don't love the Lord, then you're not going to heaven. The Bible never says that. It's just if you love the Lord, you're going to be doing His, obeying His commandments. Our love should produce an action, all right? Uh, I could say I love my wife, and then if I go do something, you know, that would be dishonoring to her, then I'm really not loving her. That doesn't mean we're no longer married. That just means I'm not loving her whenever I do those things. And the same thing with our relationship with the Lord. Uh, we need to be showing that we love Him. And if we say we love Him, but we continue doing these things, we don't love Him. Doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you're not really loving him uh, like you ought to be loving him. <clears throat> all right. And so then he breaks down. Here's some of the commandments. And Jesus himself said this, all the commandments of the law. All right. It's not 10 commandments. It's actually two commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Right. All thy mind, all thy strength. And then the second commandment is likened to the first. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Right. So all the laws of the Old Testament hang on these two laws. If you love the Lord and you love your brother, right, you're going to stay out of sin. It's as simple as that. You're not going to be sinning. You're not going to steal from somebody you love. You're not going to commit adultery on somebody that you love. Did I say that right? Yeah, you understand what I mean. You're not going to uh, kill somebody that you love. And so you may say, yeah, I loved them, but I just couldn't have. No, you, you certainly didn't love them whenever you killed them. <laughs> All right. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so here's some things that it says. Verse uh, 10. Here are the commandments, all right? He that love, he loveth his brother 
abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So here's another great illustration. The Bible talks about light. Uh, you know, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. But you're going to tell me that no Christian has ever hid his light uh, under a bushel? Of course we have. It doesn't mean we're not saved. It just means we didn't really let the light shine. And so he's saying, you need to keep the commandments. You need to let the light shine. But he that loveth his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Have you ever seen two people fighting, and they're like yelling at each other, and they're saying all kinds of ridiculous things, and you're like, these people don't even know how ridiculous they look. Because really, they're blinded by their rage, and they're blinded by their hatred for one another. And they don't even realize that everybody looking on is saying, these people are not acting like uh, they're walking in the light. They're not acting like Christians. They're not acting like, you know what I mean? Because they're just fighting, and they're doing all this stuff. And it's ridiculous. Even from a human standpoint, it's a shame, right? Those people are ashamed. But in God's eyes, it's even worse. They're going to be ashamed uh, whenever they are uh, held accountable for that. Verse 15, not only do we need to love our brethren, there's some things we need to not love. Verse 15, we see we're not to love the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. Now let me just stop up until this point. He's not saying don't love your neighbor. We know we're supposed to love our neighbor. Don't love those who need to get saved. We need to love them enough to give us the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's not telling us not to love that. Here's what, here's what he's telling us not to love. He explains, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. These are the things you need to not love. The things that your eyes would lust after, the things that the flesh would want to lust after, uh, and all these are not of the Father, but of the world. Okay, so we need to not love the world. Verse 26, here's what you need to do if you don't want to be ashamed. Keep walking in the light, but here's what you need to do. Don't be seduced by false teachers. And, and, uh, and, the, and you know, that's usually who would seduce you. is somebody who claims to be a Christian. They claim to have it all figured out, and they lead you down the wrong path. Here's what he says. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Okay, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. In a manner of speaking... Right? I don't really have to teach you anything. If you are walking in the Spirit and getting those things out of your life, the Holy Spirit is going to do the teaching. Amen. The Holy Spirit is going to draw you to His Word. The Holy Spirit is going to tell you you shouldn't be doing that. Holy Spirit is going to be telling you you should love this, uh, that person. All these things that I'm talking about, like, it's like He's not really teaching them something new. He's just saying, like, I'm writing these things so that you'll do basically what Jesus said to do, <laughs> that you'll do what the Bible says to do. And really, I shouldn't even have to teach you that th that those things is kind of what I feel like you're saying. And then he concludes it, all right? And so this is where I'll conclude as well. And now, little children, abide in him, all right? So you're going to do all these things. You're going to uh, understand what is a sin, You're not, and you're going to avoid that. You're going to keep his commandments. You're going to love the brother. You're not going to love the world, and you're not going to, you're going to be... Uh, uh, cautious of those who that might seduce you and you're not going to fall for every wave of uh, a doctrine. And then it says that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. We should walk like Christians. We should all be gathered together. Now, I think we're living in a, in a time when it's just hard to spot a Christian, you know. I, I don't believe, uh, you guys know my beliefs on the timing of the rapture and that we go through tribulation, all right? But I've often said this, if it was true, right, that at any moment we could all just, and we're all just gone, right? Because one of the arguments I've always had, you know, even as a kid, is thinking, if that's true, how are they going to even, like, how is everybody not going to know? Like, all the Christians are gone, 
right? And then one day it just kind of hit me that if it, even if that's true and everybody has just gone, I think the world would be so confused because they'd be like, wait, 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 all these guys are still here. And those are guys that we thought were Christians. <laughs> and then all the, Christ, all the people that thought they were Christians are going to be like, well, if they, all the Christians are gone, you know, those guys weren't Christians and they're gone. So <laughs> they'd be so confused. They wouldn't know anyway, right? Because we live in a weird time where it's like people say they're Christians. They don't act like Christians, right? They don't live like Christians. And so it's kind of confusing out there. But I, this, is my, this is my thinking. Here's what's going to happen. You read Revelation. We'll save this preaching for another time. But uh, there is going to be some tribulation come that we've never experienced before, all right? And the Bible says many of these things, wars, rumors of wars, they're going to happen. They're going to get a lot worse than they've been so far. The Bible says that pestilence is going to come. Hey, you think COVID-19 is bad? No, this pestilence is going to be bad. And yet there's going to be some of God's people still meeting, still winning souls, still working for the Lord, doing all these things. And then the persecution is going to come. And then there's going to be great tribulation like the world's never seen. And people are going to be turning on each other. They're going to be, you know, you're not going to buy, sell, trade, all those kinds of things. You know, you know the story. And then all these Christians, I bet by that time, you're going to know who's a Christian and who's not a Christian. <laughs> you're going to know who's a Christian and not a Christian because those guys that aren't Christians are going to be like, no, oh, there they are. Go take them. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not, they went out from among us because they were not of us, right? You're going to really see that happen when tribulation comes. There are parts of the world where they're already going through way greater tribulation than we've ever seen in the United States. All right, so that's going to uh, really, you know, make the big difference. But during those days, we're going to keep serving the Lord. And it, it, could be any, it could be any time that we get to that point, okay? We're going to keep serving the Lord, keep winning souls, right. keep, keep uh, you know, preaching the truth, whether we get our heads cut off or don't get our heads cut off. And in the end, here's why we do all that. So that when the Lord comes back, we're not ashamed. Amen. Amen. And that's all I'm looking forward to. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the truths of your word. I thank you for... Uh, this the, the, the Gospel of John and then also these three letters here and even the book of Revelation, all these great uh, <clears throat> revelations that we might learn and we might, we might understand some of the signs of the coming uh, of your coming. Lord, help us to live uh, as we are in the last days because we certainly are. John said even then they were in the last days. And we know there are many antichrists, many people that would... Uh, uh, try to deceive us, many people that would preach a false gospel, and help us not be deceived, but help us keep walking in the light and serving you so that we will not be ashamed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.